So um, we're, we're switching modes, and uh, rather than thinking about a, a, a major past event, what I really want to try and do is to uh, probably zoom in and look really at the reactions that are going on at a cellular level uh, within these tiny microorganisms, the coccolithophore, and, and uh, to try and understand the physiology of these organisms and therefore how they might react to changes in the carbon system. And so this uh, first slide is just to show you the kind of importance of coccolithophores. Each of these cells is, is about a micron across, maybe a few microns, and yet they can have a global impact uh, uh, on the world. Here's a satellite picture of these coccolithophores where um, the light is being reflected from the calcite lists that they produce, and it, just to show you the scale of the blooms of these things in the ocean. So they're very important also in controlling the partitioning of carbon between the atmosphere and between the ocean. And so uh, there's a, a, a number of primary producers in the ocean, but the coccolithophores are the main primary producer that actually also creates calcium carbonate. And the amount of that calcium carbonate that gets produced in the ocean affects how carbon dioxide is partitioned. So generally when carbon is fixed into organic matter, we can think about that in terms of this organic carbon pump and so carbon is fixed into essentially the squidgy organic matter gets taken down into the deep ocean and so acts as a sink of CO2 to the deep ocean. But if there's a major amount of calcification in the surface ocean, that actually acts in the opposite direction. So the more calcium carbonate that's produced in the surface ocean, the more CO2 actually gets released to the atmosphere due to the use of alkalinity by those organisms. So if we change the um, production of calcifiers in the surface surface ocean uh, relative to organisms which don't calcify, then that can have a major impact on the carbon cycle and act as a feedback to the carbon cycle both in the future and in the past. So there was really some alarm uh, thinking about coccolithophores as we go forwards into the future with ocean acidification and this was brought about by some really pioneering work by Ulf Riebezel where he grew these single celled algae in the laboratory and he exerted different CO2 conditions on them but he did this by lowering the pH of those laboratory cultures and what he found is when he lowered pH and therefore raised the CO2 in those laboratory cultures the coccolithophores were very much detrimental affected or at least the species that he tested in these lab experiments and he found malformation in the calcium carbonate lists, these slightly wrinkly lists as opposed to the rather pristine ones grown in lower CO2, higher pH conditions and not only that but you can also see that the amount of calcium carbonate relative to the amount of carbon that gets fixed into the cellular material really decreased as you raised the CO2 in these experiments. But something that wasn't highlighted so much is that actually this decrease in the amount of calcium carbonate to organic carbon is partly driven by a decrease in calcification, but one of the major factors that does change in these experiments is actually the amount of carbon that goes into the organic matter is actually increased, and so it could be that there is some other effect happening to these coccolithophores in these changing chemistries. And indeed, this detrimental effect of CO2 on coccolithophores seems to fly in the face of what the geological record tells us. If we go back to the Cretaceous and indeed during the times of the Eocene, we know this was a time when the coccolithophores were absolutely flourishing in the ocean. And this was a time when we had very high CO2 in the atmosphere, estimates up to about at least four times current CO2. So during these times, the coccoliths were doing incredibly well. So how do we square these two observations of the laboratory observations um, where they're very detrimentally affected by these changes or raising carbon in the environment versus what the geological record is showing us where they were really flourishing at times of high CO2. So one of the things that we might think about is that as we raise CO2 in the environment, the effect is to lower the pH in the ocean. And this is a, a graph which reflects a little bit of what Burble was talking about earlier today, where when we dissolve CO2 in the ocean, it partitions between this aqueous CO2 here um, at the lower pH values, bicarbonate at the middle pH values, um, and the carbonate ion. And of course, we always think that as we lower pH, we're going to see the carbonate ion decrease the saturation state decrease and therefore calcification ability decrease. But the flip side of that is, is that as we also lower pH, what we actually do is raise the dissolved aqueous CO2. And this is something that is actually quite good for organisms. <laughs> 
Um, if we look here, there's uh, some other um, data that have been uh, presented by Ulf Riebezel, where he raises CO2 and culture conditions with three different species, two diatoms, that's the S. costatum and the P. globosa there. But if you focus in on the E. huxleyi with the dashed lines, you can see that as you raise CO2 above present atmospheric CO2 levels, you can see that its relative photosynthetic ability actually increases as you raise the CO2 there. And so it's almost as if uh, that common and coccolithophore, Emiliani huxleyi, almost the, the coccolith weed of the modern ocean, is doing much better under those higher CO2 conditions in terms of its photosynthesis. And indeed, this makes sense. All photosynthesis is undertaken by this enzyme, Rubisco. But Rubisco is a really inefficient enzyme. It's able to catalyze both the forwards reaction of photosynthesis, so the fixing of carbon into organic matter. But it has a real tough time telling the difference between CO2 and oxygen, which is produced during that photosynthesis. And it's able to catalyze the back reaction, or the decarboxylation and photorespiration of oxygen with that organic matter resulting in an energy loss. And so Rubisco has had this continuing challenge, actually, that it really can't tell the difference between CO2 and oxygen. And over long geological timescales, we know that CO2 has decreased in the atmosphere at the same time that oxygen has risen. So it's almost catalyzed its own downfall. It's been really challenged by these changing environmental conditions. And if we look at the specificity of Rubisco, so its ability to tell the difference between CO2 and oxygen, and therefore how good it is at being able to catalyze photosynthesis in a lower CO2 world, there's a really interesting evolutionary trend in that different groups of algae have different specificities of their Rubisco, and it seems to correlate to the time at which that algae actually emerged. So as we go through geological time here, we can see that Rubisco is actually getting more more and more specific. So actually, over geological time, CO2 has exerted an evolutionary pressure that has made Rubisco evolve and adapt to become more and more efficient. So what that means is that the diatoms have got an incredibly specific Rubisco. They're very good at functioning at very low CO2 conditions. Meanwhile, the coccolithophores, which emerged a little bit before the diatoms under higher CO2 conditions, have actually got a less specific Rubisco. And so their photosynthesis is going to be more challenged by lower the, the geologically low CO2 conditions that we've had, and therefore they have the potential to respond more positively as we raise CO2 in the environment. So the really big question is, how does a coccolithophore actually respond to changing carbon in the environment? And so the majority of culture experiments that have been performed today um, have tended to decrease pH, and as a result, you have a decreasing saturation concentration at the same time as you raise CO2 in the laboratory culture. And what we decided to do was actually to, to perform some laboratory cultures that were all at exactly the same pH, but we raised the amount of carbon that was actually in that laboratory culture. And so what that meant was that we had an increasing saturation state at the same time as we're raising the CO2 in that culture. And we've performed these laboratory experiments with two different coccolithophores, the large one on the right, Coccolithus braurudii. This is a fairly ancient coccolithophore. It evolved around 50, 55 million years ago. And so it's really seen a lot of change in the environment in its evolutionary history. By contrast, we also looked at the, the smaller coccolithophores on the left-hand side there, Jephyra capsa oceanica. And that's a fairly recent newcomer to, to the coccolithophore assemblages in the last a million years or so. So we performed these experiments. Oops. And we wanted to try and see which carbon species are these coccolithophores actually responding to. And in order to do that, we've used stable isotopes as our tool. And the key feature to note is that each of these different carbon species, as we dissolve CO2 in, the, in water, has a slightly different isotopic composition. And the key thing to bear in mind is that in both for oxygen isotopes and for carbon isotopes, the carbonate ion tends to have a lighter stable isotopic composition than the bicarbonate ion. And that's going to be the key uh, fact that I'm going to use to interrogate the physiology of these two coccolithophores to, changing, uh, to the changing carbon uh, system. <laughs> 
So here are the results for Jafara capsaroceanica, the relatively small coccolithophore. And this really just shows that across all of the carbon uh, experiments that we performed, it has exactly or very similar both carbon and oxygen isotopes in the calcium carbonate that's being produced. And those uh, carbon and oxygen isotopes all reflect the bicarbonate ion in the medium. And this, so this really seems to show that under all of these different conditions, Jafara capsaroceanica is using the bicarbonate ion as the sole source for, of the carbon for its calcification. If we look to the large coccolithophore, though, for Coccolithus braurudii, we see that actually there's a big change in the isotopes according to the different carbon uh, uh, compositions. And we can see that at the lower end of the lower PCO2 conditions, we get a much lighter both oxygen and carbon isotopic composition in the calcium carbonate that's being produced. As we go to the higher um, CO2 conditions, we see that those uh, isotopes change and they become much more reflective of the bicarbonate ion. So it really looks as though this coccolithophore actually changes the dominant ion that it's using for its calcification under these different CO2 conditions, and it really seems to be using the carbonate ion at low CO2 conditions, but at the higher CO2 conditions, it switches to use the bicarbonate ion, the same as Jafira capsaroceanica. The really interesting observation was that it was actually very detrimentally affected by the high carbon conditions, and we have this malformation on the right-hand side here, where where really these coccolithophores did not like the high CO2 conditions. Interestingly, this is a coccolithophore that seemed to be fairly insensitive to changing pH. Uh, meanwhile, Jafira capsaroceanica, which I've showed you in the previous experiments, was very detrimentally affected by low pH in those experiments by Ulf Riebezel. We can also use these isotopes to interrogate the photosynthetic system, and uh, Coccolithus braurudii really does exactly as we'd expect. Um, the main thing to note is that we'd expect to have a larger fractionation when there's more carbon available to this uh, uh, coccolithophore, and indeed that's what we see as we have increasing PCO2. We see a larger isotopic fractionation of carbon isotopes going into the organic matter. And this really is, is a sort of a fundamental of the way we understand carbon isotopes in organic matter, that the higher rate of supply of carbon allows for a greater isotopic fractionation to be exerted or expressed by that rubisco. And this fits with a whole global compilation of how carbon isotopes change in organic matter. But if we look at this other species, Jafira capsaroceanica, we actually see totally the reverse. We tend to see a decreasing fractionation in these carbon isotopes as the amount of carbon increases. And this really flies in the face of our understanding of carbon isotopes in organic matter. And the way that we can try and interpret this, this is seen in a couple of other culture experiments with a large diatom here. And in some ocean sediments, we get this decreasing fractionation with increasing CO2. And this can be interpreted that we have a disproportionate increase in the rate of carbon fixation to an increase in CO2 supply. And so what this really seems to be hinting at is that this coccolithophore is actually fertilized by this increase in carbon in the environment. And indeed, we see this if we just look at very fundamental measures of growth rates and photosynthesis. We see the growth rates in this particular coccolithophore are uh, rising with this increase in carbon availability. We see an increasing rate of calcification. More specifically, we see an increasing rate of organic carbon fixation. And so this coccolithophore is being fertilized. We nonetheless get a decrease in calcification to organic carbon fixation ratio, the same as Ulf Riebezel, but this is purely due to the fertilization, essentially, of the photosynthesis of this coccolithophore. So if we try and draw this all together, here's a hypothesis to try and explain the different carbon physiologies of these two different species, um, and to try and draw it together such that calcification and photosynthesis aren't entirely decoupled. And what we could argue is that certainly in Jafira capsaroceanica, it looks as though it's using bicarbonate as the iron for its calcification, but it looks as though it's having at least some of its carbon supply for photosynthesis as CO2 diffusion fusing across this membrane. Now, if we use a really simple, just charge balance approach, we know that for cells, 
all charges that come into a cell have to be balanced by charges that come out of the cell. This means that if we're using bicarbonate for calcification, CO2 for photosynthesis, that the proton that gets generated during calcification has to be pulled out of this cell to maintain a charge balance. We must have a 2 plus calcium coming into this cell, a minus 1 bicarbonate going into this cell, but this proton therefore must come out of this cell in order to keep a charge balance. And that means that this cell is going to be sensitive to external changes in pH. It's going to be harder to pump this proton out of this cell as we lower pH. And so this could explain why this particular species seems to do poorly if we really lower the pH in the environment. But if we raise the abundance of CO2, then we have the potential to fertilize that coccolithophore. By contrast, if we look to the large coccolithophore, Coccolithis braurudii, then we would argue that it uses calcium for its uh, uh, calcification, and it uses two bicarbonates, which actually cross the membrane, and one goes to provide the source of, of carbonate for the calcium carbonate. The other is used um, to somehow increase the supply of CO2 for the photosynthesis, and this is presumably using an, extern an internal carbonic anhydrase. Meanwhile, we'd expect that G Jafara capsule oceanica may well be using this external proton to help bump up the amount of CO2 that's able to diffuse into the cell. So the, the crucial thing is here that there's no pumping of a proton out of this cell, which means it may well be insensitive to changes in pH. Um, but if we raise the carbon in the environment, there's a greater diffusive supply of CO2, and again, that could account for changing the internal pH and therefore changing the morphology um, of the calcium carbonate under those altered conditions. So this seems to really dictate, perhaps, how these different species respond to changing pH and changing abundance of carbon. Um, and this also makes sense if we look to the geological record. If something is small, um, it's going to be very much better optimized for CO2 to cross its membrane via di diffusion. And indeed, if we look at the ancestors of this particular coccolithophore over now long geological timescales going over the last 60 or 50 million years or so, we see that these smaller coccolithophores that we have in the ocean today were much larger in the past when CO2 was much more available, but they've adapted a decreased in size as we come towards the modern lower CO2 conditions. So it really looks as though this coccolith has got a very different physiology to the large coccolithophore, which has really maintained a very constant size over these long geological timescales. So this also perhaps helps us make sense um, that over the very recent timescales now, so this is some work I was involved in looking at a very high sedimentation rate core from the North Atlantic and looking at the average um, size of the coccolithophores over this time of anthropogenic rise of CO2. And we see again that the size of the coccoliths seems to have increased as we've raised CO2 and this perhaps also um, can be accounted for by a fertilizing effect of CO2 on the these smaller reticulofenestra um, uh, coccolithophores. So an, an interesting observation actually is that in the last 20 or 30 years or so, these coccolithophores, which again, the, the paradigm has been existing that they're going to be very detrimentally affected by these high CO2, low pH conditions. But what we're actually seeing is that they're expanding their biogeography into places where they really weren't found before. And so we've got this intrusion and blooming of Atlantic phytoplankton species into the high Arctic. Not only that, we're seeing subtropical coccolithophores in the Weddell Sea. Now, I don't mean to say this is all being driven by changing in the carbon system. Um, it's, it may well be, as, as Jim said, it may be that temperature is very much uh, playing a role in the distribution of these coccolithophores. But it really is, I guess I'm just trying to challenge this paradigm that they're going to be really killed off by ocean acidification. I still believe that a, a number of biological calcifiers will be detrimentally affected that have exert a lesser biological control on their ability to calcify such as the corals, where you can really think about that being a biologically mediated calcification. But for the coccolithophores, which are calcifying totally intracellularly, it really isn't clear that the saturation state that they feel inside that cell is going to be directly related to the saturation state of the ocean. And there's a whole range of physiologies and photosynthesis changes which may indeed help them to calcify in this lowering uh, saturation state ocean. <laughs> 
So just to conclude, um, I, I think that we can, we can nonetheless look at coccolithophore responses to changing carbon pH as being species specific, but we really need to consider the physiologies of these organisms to truly understand um, how they're going to respond to changing ocean acidification. And I hope I've tried to give you a flavor whereby we can look at interactions between phytoplankton and climate and the carbon system in the past, where it has perhaps exerted some kind of evolutionary pressure to change the physiology of phytoplankton, and we can indeed use that as a key to try and help us predict how they may respond in the future. So thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Ross. Any questions to Ross? I have one. You can think of more. Meanwhile, so this... Uh, size adaptation to um, availability of CO2. Is this, does this require an evolutionary process or can that happen from, well, from one gen generation to the next so that a just, uh, uh, an algae just um, well, grows larger um, from one generation to the next? Uh. I th yeah, I think that's a, it's a good question, and, and certainly you see some kind of normal distribution in the size of algae if, if you just grow them under certain conditions. But I think you can certainly, you c it does seem that when you change um, the, the conditions as we have here, you change the amount of carbon that can get fixed into the cells, and indeed we, we see some small hints that you do actually slightly change the size of the cells that we were growing in, in the experiments that we had. So I suspect that on those geological timescales, yes, there is an evolutionary pressure which when you, you, you have a normal distribution of sizes that yes, something that's smaller will do better and flourish and then ultimately procreate. Um, so but I, I think it can change fairly fast in culture. Any questions for tonight? Um, we, we expect undersaturation in perhaps to the end of the century if we follow a business as usual CO2 emission path in the Arctic with respect to cult site. Um, would you expect then that this has an impact on, on the functioning of the cocos? Uh, when the shell might be prone to dissolution without protect or if there is no protective mechanism or so I, th I think that's a it's it's a great question and, and I, I certainly I guess in a, in a sense it, it can partly be answered by some of Jim's uh, work where certainly during the, the the height of this acidification event you see no calcite being preserved in the deep ocean I think the the, the question is can it be produced and I guess I, I, I feel quite strongly that, that a number of organisms aren't necessarily controlled, or sorry, a number of organisms which make shells aren't necessarily controlled by saturation state. We certainly know that the diatoms in the ocean are producing biogenic silica in an ocean that's entirely undersaturated with respect to silica. We also have these, this bizarre group, the Acantheria, which are producing tests out of strontium sulfate, and there's nowhere in the ocean that is saturated with respect to strontium sulfate. So, to my mind, Mind, it's certainly clear that not for, not for all organisms do we have to worry about saturation state and their ability to make a shell. Uh, more than once we've seen uh, recent results by Anderson showing high opal flux during the Antarctic A events. And uh, would you be able to comment on whether maybe this high opal flux is a response to the high CO2 rather than directly being uh, related to uh, ocean fertilization? Wow, that's a good question. Um, I'm just trying to think about that. It's... I guess the, the, the difference is actually that... that Hmm. I was, what I was going to say is that, that opal is, is only dissolved as dissolved silica, basically. Um, whereas for calcifiers, for instance, you've got all this, this reservoir of bicarbonate, and uh, the, you know, the major reservoir of carbon is bicarbonate rather than the carbonate iron. So, in a sense, calcifiers can be more adaptable because they've, if, if they can access the larger 
carbonate or bicarbonate reservoir, they're less sensitive to the saturation state. Whereas with opal producers, they do ultimately, they can produce opal in undersaturated waters, but they still, they've, they've got to have silica from somewhere. Um, so whether the, the A events, I mean, certainly we know that the CO2 gets higher at that time and, and you know, there's this beautiful work on the deglaciation where you have this massive pulse of, of silica production that also coincides with the rise in CO2. It, it's a good question. I mean, I, I do think that, that at glacial levels of CO2, you know, at sort of 180 ppm, things that are really relying on a diffusive supply of CO2 could well be struggling. It, it's, it's an interesting question as to what does that minimum level of CO2 really do for photosynthesizers. Any more questions? Thank you. Uh, you show some pictures of uh, mar formation. Uh, any uh, idea about the physiology behind it? And the second second question is, even they uh, don't grow perfectly, they are ugly, but do they still do their job? Okay, so I guess from from the culture experiments that I showed here, the, the interesting thing was that we found the malformation when the large coccolith seemed to be using the bicarbonate iron rather than the carbonate iron. And so my interpretation of that is that the malformation arises because you're acidifying, or the, the, the pH at the point of calcification is getting lower. So for whatever reason, one is unable to expel the protons from that calcifying vesicle. Now, I would argue, at least in the, the, the case of the smaller coccolithophore, they, they can't pump it out when you've got low pH conditions outside of the cell. And so that leads to a rise in the, it, or a rise in the concentration of protons and a lowering of pH in that calcify, calcifying vesicle. Um, now, whether, that's, whether it's, it's lowering the pH itself at that site of calcification that affects the malformation, in, in the end, you probably have to say that it could be lowering the pH affects somehow the, the folding of the acidic polysaccharide that they use as a template for the calcification. Um, but I guess I was, I was kind of excited to see that change in the isotopes because it really gave me some firm evidence that at least perhaps at, at underlying that process is a, is a lowering of the pH at the point of calcification. Now, what that does to the actual morphology, is, it, it's harder to, to say. Um, now, whether they're detrimentally affected or not, it's a good question. We certainly saw that the growth rates in those cultures went down. The other interesting thing is that you almost never, you never find these malformed coccoliths in the sediments. Um, so they, they've sort of been looked for. And so one could question, is this malformation something that's purely arising in cultures because we're putting them under such crazy extreme uh, conditions, whereas the changes that occur in, in the natural ocean, you never find malformed coccoliths. And I certainly know they've looked for them in the PETM sediments and, and found nothing there. So um, it's, it's it, I guess, the, the, the physiological evidence in our cultures did suggest that malformation meant they weren't happy. Um, so if... if <laughs> Is there any lingering question, maybe also still to the policy in YouTube, very much? change the condition of the cultures in a rapid manner, when in nature it takes many, many generations of, 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 of uh, coccolithophores to get to a different uh, test. So how do you think, basically, the, under conditions of small changes, uh, relative small gradients of change, you can go to 280 or you can go to 500, but the stress is much smaller. So how do you deal with that? I'm not sure I'm going to answer your question, but I'm going to say what I want to say, so, which is that, <laughs> that um, I, I absolutely agree with you that, that these short-term perturbations that we perform in cultures, whether they really um, uh, 
whether they really show how organisms may adapt in the environment is, is, is a major question. Having said that, I think that um, trying to find out what the underlying physiology of the organisms is in those changed conditions is incredibly helpful. And I suppose, you know, with ocean acidification, there, there are two ways to go. You can either just take a whole bunch of organisms, you can put them in different culture conditions, you could even try and do these over much longer time scales. And that may be very interesting, but I'm, I'm going to sort of put my hat on, I'm going to kind of say, I think we need to understand the mechanisms. And we still don't fully understand how photosynthesis... or a great interest of mine is in carbon concentrating mechanisms in these organisms. Um, and when you try and look at the literature on photosynthesis, carbon concentrating mechanisms, mechanisms in algae, there's three or four papers and they all just say, we don't know very much about this. And so I, I truly believe that we actually have to try and fully understand the, the physiological reactions behind an organism's response to changing carbon systems rather than just propagating a number of experiments that, that is, I'm going to say it, a little bit like stamp collecting without kind of truly understanding the process. <laughs>